Hey watercolor wizards, Hajra here. In this video I'll be reviewing and demoing Schmincke Transparent Watercolor Ground. As usual, art blogs, Q&A, sketches, deconstructed paintings, video notes, art gifts, and more rewards are available for my patrons on Patreon. Thanks for parking your brushes here and let the epic art adventures begin. My first attempt with this watercolor ground, as you'll see, was a fail, as the watercolor ground just handled way too differently than paper for me to use my usual style and techniques. My second attempt was more successful, as I knew the product properties better then and I worked around the limitations rather than fighting them. It still didn't end up how I like a painted piece to look in quality and appearance, but I'll share what I discovered so you can know what watercolor ground is good and bad for. So I decided to try the watercolor ground out on coloring book page paper. I only own two coloring books because I like to draw my own pieces and use arches or other nice watercolor paper as a painting surface. So the cheap cardstock of this Muha coloring book is pretty awful. I lamented it in a previous video where I did a Muha study from a different page in this book. So I decided I could try this new Schmincke transparent watercolor ground that I bought on this coloring book page paper and maybe turn the cardstock into a better watercoloring surface since the ground was conveniently transparent rather than an opaque white. And we'll see that life doesn't always give you what you ask for. This was definitely a twisted monkey's paw wish type of experience. So I did two coats of the watercolor ground on the paper to ensure nice coverage drying between coats and I got a good evenly covered surface of this product on the paper. And I found that approximately one and a half ounces of the watercolor ground covered two of these 12 by 12 inch coloring book page sheets twice. So it is economical in that a little went a long way. The ground is just a clear acrylic that dries porous so you can paint with watercolor over it and you'll need to use soap and water like you use with acrylic paints when rinsing out your brush. I wouldn't recommend applying with a coarse hair brush or a squeegee because it'll give a less even surface when it dries. So use a cheap but soft nylon brush. And I also wouldn't use a brush that you use for watercolor painting because those are probably your nicer brushes and I don't tend to mix my acrylic painting and watercolor painting brushes. I ended up getting a few grainy areas on my paper after it all dried, but I think that that was all my fault. I think the last of the watercolor ground that I poured into my little bowl was drying at the bottom of it when I got to it, so I deposited little granules in a few places, so I'll be careful about that next time. I have at least two other Alphonse Muha study videos, so if you want to learn more on him and his style, along with my painting techniques, go and check out those Master Studies videos. This video will not discuss Muha and Art Nouveau history, as I needed to focus on the review and use of this this new product, this transparent watercolor ground as a painting surface. And what I discovered from my first attempt with this watercolor ground was that the paint didn't want to stick to the surface and it totally drove me crazy. Just watch me doing this throughout the entire video and you'll see what I mean. I tried blending out wet edges and they always streaked and lifted. I tried letting the edges dry completely and then softening the dry edges and they also just streaked and lifted. And when I tried layering over previously dried layers, I was getting this ugly cheap marker coloring look. Everything I was doing to this face to mold and paint the features and contours was streaky and it was just holding me back from what I was trying to do. And the hair looked patchy. I worked with Create a Color Aqua Sticks as paint first, which worked like a gouache. Then I tried transparent watercolors. Things just smeared and streaked and lifted. When I compared my older Muha study on the same cardstock, without any watercolor ground over it when I was doing the painting, it actually looked better and softer and more amenable to blending edges and layers, even though if you watch that video, you'll know that I hated that cardstock at the time. So I stopped at some point, partially through, trying to paint this coloring page with a watercolor ground on it. For some endeavors, you just have to see that it's got a big old fail brand on it after a point, and that's okay. I can rally my forces for a different art adventure. And in this case, I did. I started out on the second coloring book page and this one was also painted and dried off with the two coats of the watercolor ground from earlier. This time I modified my painting technique so it didn't just become a repeat of the first failed attempt. So I started out differently. I put a semi-opaque gouache skin layer with aqua sticks on the face and then I lifted back with just a damp brush to get some of the facial contours. It was more successful than trying to add them on in layers. All of my blending for soft edges or delicate gradients and layers that I love to do as I usually paint with watercolor won't work on this watercolor ground surface because it's just not a paper. It's plastic and it smears and streaks and lifts the paint rather than blending edges smoothly. So I gave up on that for this particular Muha study. Then I left the face to dry completely. Paint applied to the watercolor ground needs to dry completely between color layers just to give it a chance, a hope of layering layering a bit later. So once this color layer is totally dry, I'm going to come back later and dry brush with thicker watercolor paint over the top for attempting details in the face. And in other areas on the piece, I'll actually even use an ink marker. But again, by 
now, I was not expecting it to act like paper. The paint sits on top of the plastic surface rather than sinking in like it would on a cotton or even a wood pulp paper, and it's prone to lifting and smearing and streaking. So I moved on for a while to the background. For the face, I used Aqua Sticks as paint, and for the background, I used Daniel Smith watercolors from the dot card swatches I reviewed in another video. And just like with the face, I applied more of what I learned from my first failed attempt. Since this ground surface wants colors to streak and run, I decided not to fight it. I dropped in the watercolors, a juicy, runny type of background, and I just let the pleats go wild and figured I'd pull back some order into the piece by re-inking all the outlines with thick, dark marker lines after all of this was dry. The nice thing with the watercolor ground is that the colors are more vibrant with less amounts of any pigment because it's all sitting on the surface. And yeah, you can get the same vibrancy on cotton watercolor paper, but after using a larger amount of paint or color. In comparison, this ground lets you use smaller amounts of your watercolor gouache, ink tents, or whatever it is that you're using when striving for vibrancy. So at least that was a cute find. In fact, this watercolor ground was like Yupo, which is a plastic art paper, if you put Yupo in a bottle. And like Yupo, you can erase by lifting over and over, so it can be good for introductory techniques or fixing mistakes and very loose watercolor pieces. Since I tried various art paints during my demo, I know that lifting on the ground happens for gouache, watercolor crayon, and watercolor. And waterproof zig markers and waterproof ink tents blocks also lifted and smeared when I used them later, but less if they were applied as the first layer of any kind of paint on the ground. For conventional artwork, framing and matting for display should prevent smear risks. And I haven't done it myself. Don't know if spraying fixative on it will actually make stuff run and smear too, so try that on like a little scrap first before you do it on your painting. When I came back to the face, I used ink tents blocks as paint in the hopes that the ink tents would actually lift and smear less. The ink tents did still lift and smear, more in areas where there was earlier non-waterproof paint underneath. But even for the lips where I took off all the paint before I applied the ink tents, I still got smears and streaks and liftings I tried to layer and develop the lip shadows. In the end, I may do the best I could and did a simplified face, hair, and later jewelry and clothing. I could see that the face and features needed some correcting and building up, but I left off of that because it just kept lifting up and not working with layers and shapes that I wanted to add and refine. I do really like the runny ink bleeds in the background. They have an enormous amount of character and a nice melty texture and interesting colors. And when I was done letting the background effects dry in sections, the ink outlines I did over them with a black Sig Rider marker really made them pretty and pull together. So I like how watercolor ground can create a vibrant, runny, faux ink piece without inks. But I much prefer the detailed, layer-friendly, and softer edge appearance of watercolor on cotton paper. And you can do these runny effects on watercolor paper too. It's just they look a bit softer. On this paper, they're more hard edged. That's what makes it look more like it's ink instead of watercolor. I spent a bit of time also doing some wet on dry small area paint application for the various gems and jewels that the woman is wearing. I decided I wasn't going to do much more with them as far as layers go. It would have been nice to develop some more layered shiny stones and gems, but it was just too challenging for me on this surface, especially because there's just so many gems in this piece. So I'll just leave that for good old watercolor paper projects. I did the dress and shawl in the near background in more wet runny color deposits like the background medallions. I did the same runny technique for the leaves in her hair and her crown. The random bleeds did make the crown and leaves really lovely just like it did with the background, but it made the shadows of the fabric folds inaccurate in numerous areas where stuff bled too much in the wrong direction. So this is again good for loose stuff, but not so great for controlled form areas. Maybe someone else has worked with it for years and really loves it, but it didn't hide my own painting abilities. Thank God for cotton watercolor paper. If there was only watercolor ground, I think I would have given up on detailed watercolor and gouache painting near the start. I did come back and outline the woman too. Again, just like the background, I felt it would help make everything more polished. And I was lucky that this was a Muha study and darker ink outlines could only make it better and more Muha-esque. If this had been a sans ink outline piece, I don't think I would have finished it because I don't really know how I could have made it look more polished beyond an abstract background. Anyway, I used a dark brown chocolate Zig Rider marker on most of the woman's outlines and a darker true black Zig marker on the back and the rest of the piece. I found that with the ink markers and also later with the gel pen that I used that they got clogged by lifting up the paint sitting on the surface and I had to clean them off on scrap paper repeatedly as they would stop working on the page. This made for even more work and I think it would be useful for others like me who want to conserve hand movements due to health issues that this is not a painting surface that makes it easy on my hands. And another thing to note is that regular paper, even smooth paper like Bristol, has some catch in it, has a paper type of catch in it. So the 
marker lines are just more controlled. This was such a slick surface that my ink lines were also just sloppier and I didn't get very many neat, longer, straight or curved lines. And I think you can see that in the final piece. And I did come back in some areas with a white gel pen to add highlights on some of the gems and areas of the face and hair. Again, with less success than on actual paper, but I may do. I should mention that the Schmincke transparent watercolor ground was not at all smelly. I tried the Daniel Smith watercolor ground some years ago and it was really smelly. It made my eyes water and I had an allergic reaction to it and I had to return it immediately. The watercolor ground by Schmincke also has a finer tooth than the Daniel Smith watercolor ground. And the Daniel Smith watercolor ground was more pebbly and coarse, even though it was sold as a cold press finish and not like as a rough finish. The Schmincke one is a lot smoother as a surface. It made the inking easier. Also, the Daniel Smith watercolor ground didn't seem any more amenable to details and better at emulating a paper type painting surface. It was also just good for runny abstract effects and not ideal for layered detailed pieces. Schmincke also makes an opaque white watercolor ground in coarse and fine finishes along with this transparent one. You can also buy watercolor ground from Core, and all of these watercolor grounds are just a porous acrylic that dries so that you have a surface that'll accept some watercolor. And I got this transparent watercolor ground for its versatility and also in the hopes that I wouldn't be allergic to it. It can be used transparent over drawings, also tinted with paint, and that's where the versatile part comes in. So you can tint this with white, tan, black, or other colors to change the color, and you can even make it metallic for a shimmery or iridescent surface. This all sounds really fun for abstract backgrounds and loose ink and wash pieces, and not anything much more complicated than that. My personal opinion is that it's not even as worthwhile as cheap cardstock, which I've used for projects when I got cardstock cards with my ATC haul card packs and also on past coloring book page experiments. And I know that cardstock stains immediately and won't let you lift or blend much, but it is still good for ink and wash, ink, or loose abstract watercolor pieces. This is the same exact stuff that this watercolor ground is letting you do, but with one major difference. Nothing sticks to the surface of this ground and the constant streaking and lifting is really insanity inducing. And it makes sense as a plastic surface is going to be naturally water repellent and they've just made it porous so it's usable with watercolor, but the color still never sinks in. So I'd prefer even the cardstock as a real paper for less energy and frustration. And I'm going to try to use my watercolor ground bottle, I hope, since I got it all the way from the UK. I probably should have ordered the smaller bottle and not the larger one, but I can't return it now. I wouldn't personally recommend buying this watercolor ground or other watercolor grounds that I've tried in the past. They are totally not Arches paper in a bottle or even cheaper watercolor paper in a bottle. And to try to like, you know, make good on my investment, I'll try this on other surfaces like wood ornaments or jewelry components and, and try to see what that results in. And I'm intrigued by the tinting possibilities and who knows if that'll make it better or worse as a ground. There's also the idea that just doing a lot of dry brush strokes for the whole page will help you do a more detailed piece, but I don't think I care to try that since I don't want to fight a surface for details. I'd rather just use real watercolor paper that'll make details easy for me. I'll probably end up reserving my bottle of ground for runny abstract background areas of certain projects on cheaper paper and just call it a day. Well, wizards, I did finish this demo all the way through, even though the final study is not close to my usual quality of painting. It ended up looking very strident in the transitions and not soft, rather like alcohol markers used poorly, which is what I've been saying since the start. And there are inaccuracies in the face and hand and fabric folds that are pretty noticeable to me at my personal level of painting, but I still wanted to finish and post this demo for review purposes. If you look at another Muha study I did where I drew it freehand and painted it on Arches watercolor paper, the difference in rendering quality and edges and details even at just the grisaille level is astounding. The Arches paper let me do way fewer hours of work for a much more refined result. And I think I heard my watercolor brother Steve Mitchell say on his channel that Arches really is the best and he was just talking about papers, but I think that based on what I experienced here, I'd say that anything in a bottle is not going to be replacing cotton watercolor paper anytime soon either. So to recap, the Schmincke watercolor ground is a porous plastic watercolor accepting surface. It can be used transparent or tinted and made opaque. It doesn't suit my layered, detailed, gradient blended watercolor style at all, but if you love Yupo and just want to do abstract, runny, vivid backgrounds with stamping on top or a simple dry brush or ink line drying on top, then this is probably cheaper 
deeper and more versatile than Yupo since you can put it on all sorts of paper and other support shapes and types and it can be tinted with other colors and it is an artist grade product. So it totally depends on your art style. This really turned out to be a, a monster of a video and I hope you found my experience with watercolor ground and the info I put into this video helpful. Thanks for parking your brushes here. Please like, subscribe, and check out my website links and Patreon page to support my art and art channel below. As always, wishing you all epic art adventures.